welcome to lecture series on advanced geotechnical engineering course. Uh, we are into module number 6 which is on buried structures or buried conduits. Uh, this is lecture 1. So the contents of uh, uh, buried structures or buried pipes in this advanced geotechnical engineering course are uh, load on pipes, Marston's load theory for rigid and flexible pipes and trench and projection conditions and minimum cover requirement and pipe flotation and liquefaction issues. So we will try to look into uh, the trench and projection conditions first and thereafter we will introduce ourselves to Marston's load theory. So these buried conduits or the buried pipes are very important from the infrastructure point of view like many underground utilities which are required nowadays to be embedded below the ground level and these are on offshore as well as an onshore. So these buried pipelines are divided into two main categories and these are called as ditch conduits that is conduits which are embedded in a ditch or a trench and as not all conduits can be put below the ground level so that some of the conduits will be projecting out or above the ground surface they are called embankment conduits or projecting conduits. So based on the method of installation according to Spangler and Handy uh, 1973 they have been divided uh, principally into two categories first ditch conduits and projecting conduits. So in this particular uh, slide what we are seeing is a trench and uh, with a pipe of certain diameter D and H is the uh, you know height above the pipe from the center line height above the pipe. So you can see that this is the natural ground the side walls and this is the backfill. So the trench is excavated the pipe is placed and it is again backfilled and then brought to the natural ground surface. So this type of conduits are called ditch conduit and they are also called trench conduit condition. So the pipe is, uh, uh, is installed in a narrow trench generally the trench width will be less than or equal to 2 times the diameter in undisturbed soil then backfill to the natural ground surface. So pipe is installed in a narrow trench and the width of this trench which is BD or B is nominally is less than or equal to 2 times the diameter of the pipe then the backfill to the natural ground surface. So examples of this type of conduits are sewers, drains, water mines, gas mines and buried oil pipelines. So various classes of conduits in installation we are actually trying to look into it and first category we have discussed is the ditch conduit or trench conduit where the pipe is installed in a narrow trench generally the trench width is less than or equal to 2 times the diameter and is installed in undisturbed soil then it is backfilled to the natural ground surface. So examples of this type of conduits are sewers, drains, water mains gas mains and buried oil pipelines. There is also uh, you know another type which is called projecting conduits. The projecting conduits are further divided into two classes positive projecting conduit and negative projecting conduit. So in the case of a positive projecting conduit it is a conduit or a pipe installed in shallow bedding with the top of the pipe cross section projecting above the natural ground surface. So if this is the uh, top of the embankment surface that is the fill above the ground then the pipe is actually placed on the ground surface and H is the height above the uh, uh, you know center of the pipeline. So a positive projecting conduit is a conduit or a pipe installed in a shallow bedding with the top of the pipe cross top of the pipe cross section projecting above the natural ground surface. So this is actually projecting above the natural ground. 
So basically highway and railroad culverts are often installed in this way. Uh, highway and uh, railroad culverts are often installed in this way. So highway and railroad culverts they are basically called as uh, you know the positive projecting conduits. So a positive projecting conduit is a conduit or a pipe installed in a shallow bedding with the top of the pipe cross section uh, projecting above the natural ground surface. The, uh, there is also another class of projecting conduit is called uh, negative projecting conduit. A negative projecting conduit is, con is a conduit installed in a relatively narrow and a shallow ditch with the top of the conduit below the natural ground surface and the ditch is then backfilled with a loose soil and embankment is constructed. So uh, this is uh, you know negative uh, projecting conduit is a relatively uh, is installed in a relatively shallow trench and uh, the trench is uh, and which is below the, the top of the pipe is below the natural ground and uh, the ditch is then backfilled with loose soil and embankment is constructed. So this is basically effective in reducing the load on the conduit especially if the backfill above the conduit is uh, backfill above the conduit is loose soil. So this is effective in reducing the load on the conduit especially if the backfill above the conduit is a loose soil. So the negative projective conduit is basically is installed in a relatively narrow and a shallow ditch with the top of the conduit below the natural ground surface and the, the ditch is then backfilled with the loose soil and an embankment is constructed. Then there is also another class of uh, uh, you know condu uh, in category of conduits which is called imperfect ditch conduit. Uh, this is a special case uh, similar to negative embankment condition but more favorable from standpoint of load reduction on pipe used in very deep installations and difficult to achieve for uh, large diameter pipes and this type of construction is called imperfect ditch conduit or uh, induced uh, trench conduits. So this is a special case similar to uh, negative uh, embankment condition but more favorable uh, from standpoint of load reduction on pipe used in very deep installations and difficult to achieve uh, for large diameter pipes and this type of construction is called imperfect ditch conduit or induced trench conduit. So here uh, these uh, you know here the natural ground is there and the pipe is uh, uh, you know above the natural ground surface the top of the pipe is above the natural ground surface and it is uh, 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 the, this is this portion of the soil above the right above the uh, pipe is excavated and refilled with loose soil and then uh, embankment is constructed. So although effective in reducing the load on the conduits this type of con uh, construction with loose backfill uh, encourages channels of seepage, seepage flow through the embankment and not recommended for wet areas. So for example this particular the use of this loose fill uh, encourages basically in reducing the uh, load on the conduit but this type of construction uh, with loose backfill encourages the channeling of seepage flow through the embankment hence it is not recommended for uh, wet areas. So this uh, type of uh, uh, you know the uh, projecting condition of the installation condition of the uh, conduit is called as a imperfect ditch condition or induced trench condition induced trench conduit. This is induced trench conduit is that the top of the pipe is above the uh, natural ground and it is uh, uh, you know uh, used in very deep installations and uh, here this portion is uh, uh, excavated and refilled with a loose soil. But because of this uh, uh, you know loose soil there can be you know encouragement of the uh, formation of uh, channel of seepage flow through the embankment hence it is not recommended for wet areas. So in this uh, particular uh, slide uh, typically uh, you know types of buried pipes or conduits are shown once again and uh, this is the uh, ditch conduit where this is the uh, uh, you know the side walls and where this is backfilled with uh, uh, you know uh, certain soil and this is the ground surface. So this is BD is the breadth of the uh, trench and D0 is the external diameter of the uh, pipe and this is the backfill. In case of a positive 
producing a positive projecting conduit where uh, you have the diameter d naught and the embankment top is here so at the top of the pipe projects above the ground surface so the here in the in the positive projecting conduit top of the pipe is projects above the ground surface and above that the embankment uh, construction will happen and negative projecting conduit uh, pipe is placed in a shallow trench and the top lies below the ground surface the top of the pipe lies below the ground surface so uh, this is the <coughs> negative projecting conduit and this imperfect ditch conduit is again shown here uh, schematically where you have got uh, a top of the pipe above the natural ground surface and a portion which is actually uh, you know filled with loose soil basically to reduce the load on the conduit and then embankment is constructed on the top so this type of uh, construction of uh, conduit is called installation of conduit is called imperfect ditch conduit so uh, we have seen uh, different types of uh, uh, you know the conduit installations and accordingly the marston uh, has actually proposed uh, you know load theory in 1913 so in 1913 Anson Marston developed a, a theory uh, to explain the characteristics of soil columns above a buried conduit. So because of the shear resistance provided by the walls of the trench known as the soil arching. So we need to understand what is this uh, soil arching, soil arching is a phenomenon in which uh, yielding mass transfers the uh, forces or stresses to the non yielding uh, uh, zones. So a significant fraction of the weight of the soil above the conduit is transferred to the walls of the ditch thus reducing the load on the conduit. So because of the shear resistance provided by the walls of the trench known as the soil arching action a significant fraction of the weight of the soil above the conduit is transferred to walls of the ditch and then reducing the load on the conduit. So the we have this soil arching phenomenon is actually uh, is uh, uh, visible in number of uh, you know applications in geotechnical engineering namely uh, in uh, retaining walls or in tunnels and in uh, buried conduits. So with reference to from buried conduits point of view we will try to see what is this soil arching and uh, there are two types of arching one is called active arching and passive arching. So the Marston's load theory we will introduce ourselves and then see that how the you know load transfer onto the pipe is a can be computed for a given condition. So the let us now try to understand about uh, the soil arching, soil arching can be you know the best described as a, a transfer of forces between a yielding mass of geomaterial and adjoining stationary members. So arching can be best described as a transfer of forces between a yielding mass of geomaterial and adjoining uh, stationary members. So stationary members are nothing but non-yielding zones in case of buried conduits it is you know the side walls. So a redistribution of stresses in the soil body takes place. So the shear strength the shear resistance tends to keep the yielding mass in its original position resulting in change of pressure on both the yielding parts you know support and then adjoining part of the soil. So a redistribution of stresses in soil body takes place because of this participation of this arching and the shear resistance tends to keep the yielding mass in its original position resulting in a change of pressure on both the yielding part support and the adjoining part of the soil. So uh, this uh, topic of soil arching we have actually also discussed in uh, uh, you know when we are discussing about slope stabilization. Uh, using piles that is pile, st uh, pile slope stabilization and we said that uh, when uh, uh, pipes uh, when piles are placed uh, very close to the uh, each other with uh, center to center distance within the slope at an optimum location within the slope then we said that the participation of arching is visible and when the pi piles are spaced apart like s is equal to 8, uh, 8d uh, then d is the diameter of the uh, you know pile then we said that the piles will behave like individual piles and then visibility of uh, our participation of arching is uh, marginal or negligible. So similarly uh, we have the phenomenon here that when the uh, trench is narrow and uh, when the fill uh, is actually is trying to settle and uh, the redistribution of the uh, stresses takes place 
and the shear resistance tends to keep the yielding mass in its original portion uh, resulting in a change of pressure on both the yielding parts support and the adjoining part of the soil. If the yielding part moves downward that means that uh, the soil above the uh, conduit the shear resistance will act upward and reduce the stress at the base of the yielding mass. So what will happen is that if the yielding part moves downward the shear resistance will act upward and reduce the stress at the base of the yielding mass. If the yielding part moves upward suppose if the yielding part moves upward the shear resistance will act downward to impede this movement and cause of increase of stress at the support of the yielding part. So if the yielding part moves upward, if the yielding part moves upward the shear resistance will act downward to impede this movement and the cause of increase of stress at the support of the yielding. So this causes to uh, the stress increases, uh, this, this causes uh, to the, uh, the, the stress increase uh, at the support of the yielding part. So if the yielding part moves downward the shear resistance will act upward and reduce the stress at the base of the yielding mass. So this will actually happen in the narrow uh, you know the trench conduit or ditch, ditch, ditch conduit condition. If the yielding part moves upward the shear resistance will act downward and to impede this movement uh, and, uh, and also causes increase of the stress at the support of the yielding part. So consider uh, let as we said that there are two types of archings one is called active arching and the other one is called passive arching. So here if the structure is uh, uh, compressible so the displacement under the under pressure PS when the structure is more compressible than the surrounding soil. So this is a typical structure which is considered and this is the uh, surrounding soil. So the, 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 the pattern of displacements at, uh, at plane AA and BB would be like this. And uh, displacements under pressure PS when the structure is more compressible uh, than the surrounding soil. You can see that the soil uh, in this portion will undergo uh, you know settlement, and uh, so this is the display the displacement patterns under the pressure when structure is more compressible than the surrounding soil. So in this case, what will happen is that active arching occurs when the structure is more compressible than the surrounding soil. So uh, in active arching occurs when the structure is more compressible than the surrounding soil. So if the structure deforms uniformly on plane AA and plane BB the stresses on it tend to be lower toward the edges due to mobilized shear, stress, shear stresses in the soil. So if the structure deforms uh, like this and if the structure is uh, more compressible than the surrounding soil then uh, in plane at plane AA or BB the stresses on it tends to be on the lower uh, lower toward the edges due to the mobilized shear stresses in the soil. So because of the mobilized shear stresses the stresses will be uh, lower and then you can see that the surrounding uh, areas that is the uh, non yielding portions are actually receiving the higher stresses. So this is uh, a, a, you know terminology of uh, you know what, what we are defini defining is the active arching. Active arching occurs when the structure is more compressible than the surrounding soil that we need to note down active arching occurs when the structure is more compressible than the surrounding soil. Now we as we said uh, the another type of arching is passive arching and uh, the pattern of displacements will be like this uh, in case of uh, passive arching where the structure is less compressible than the surrounding soil. When the structure is less compressible than the surrounding soil so that means that here these settlements in this zone will be less and the surrounding soil actually yields more. That means that there will be differential settlements here, there will be differential settlements here and there will be you know, you know the, there will not be any settlements here. So this is the displacement pattern under pressure PS when the structure is less compressible than the surrounding soil. The structure is less compressible than the surrounding soil. So in case of uh, passive arching the soil is more compressible than the structure. So passive arching occurs when the soil is actually more compressible than the structure. So as a result the soil undergoes large uh, displacements and a mobilization of uh, shear stresses which increase the total pressure on the structure while decreasing the pressure on the adjacent ground. So 
as a result what you can see is that the soil undergoes large displacements and uh, uh, be because of the reduction in the um, occurrence of settlements you can see that mobilizing uh, uh, you know the shear stresses uh, which increase the total pressure on the structure while decreasing the pressure on the adjacent ground. So this is the typical stress distribution across plane A or B where you can see that and at the edges you will see that uh, the stresses are highest and uh, the lowest in the center line. So this is because as the assuming that the structural deformations are uniform uh, being uh, you know in the sense that rigid compared to uh, compared to uh, you know the surrounding soil the stresses are highest at the edges and lowest at the center line. So you can see that this uh, distribution is because the st structural deformations are uniform being rigid uh, uh, compared to inherently rigid compared to surrounding soil the stresses are highest at the edges uh, at the edges and lowest at the center. So in the passive arching the soil is actually more compressible than the structure and uh, assuming that the structural deformations are uniform the stresses are highest at the edges uh, and uh, lowest at the center line. So as a result what you can see that the soil undergoes large displacements mobilizing shear stresses which increase the total pressure on the structure while decreasing the pressure on the adjacent ground. So after having seen active uh, arching and passive arching uh, we said that active arching occurs when uh, structure is uh, uh, you know uh, under uh, is more flexible uh, uh, more uh, structure is uh, 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 in case of passive arching the soil is more compressible than the structure uh, in case of uh, uh, active arching uh, soil is uh, you know uh, uh, structure is more compressible than the surrounding soil okay. So when the uh, rigid uh, in the case of rigid pipe now uh, where you can see that there are two types we will come across that is called rigid pipes and flexible pipes. And rigid pipes when the side columns of soil or the external prisms are more compressible than the pipe due to inherent instability and this causes the pipe to assume the load generated across the width of the trench. So when the side columns of soil or external prisms are more compressible than the pipe due to its inherent rigidity and uh, this causes the pipe to assume the load generated across the width of the trench. So uh, just now we have seen in uh, uh, passive arching uh, you know the soil is more compressible than the structure. So similarly here when the here when the side columns of the soil or the external prisms are more compressible than the pipe due to inherent rigidity this causes the pipe to assume the load generated across the width of the trench. And the shearing stresses or the frictional forces that develop due to differential settlement of the external prisms and the central prism, central prism of soil are additive to the load of the central prism alone. So this is uh, defined as a rigid pipe. So rigid pipes show the signs of distress before being vertically deflected at 2% of the diameter that is rigid pipes show the signs of distress before being vertically deflected uh, by 2% of the diameter. So in the rigid pipe when the sides of uh, so columns of soil or the external prisms are more compressible than the pipe due to its inherent rigidity and this causes the pipe to assume the load generated across the width of the trench and the shearing stresses are the frictional forces that develop due to differential settlement of the external prisms and the central prism are additive to the load on the central, uh, central prism alone. So in this condition uh, this type of uh, uh, pipe is called rigid pipes and rigid pipes are uh, show the signs of distress before being vertically deflected at 2 percent of the diameter. The Typical rigid pipes include reinforced concrete cylinder, pre-stressed concrete pipes and vitrified clay and polymer concrete and a cast iron, asbestos cement and cast iron situ pipes. So what we can see is that uh, in a effect of the soil settlement will be being the structure is uh, rigid here. So this is a, a type of uh, passive arching condition, we, this is a type of passive arching condition what we have discussed the surrounding soil he undergoes the differential settlements and where here because of the inherent rigidity uh, the structure will not undergo any uh, different movements but the because of this uh, you know as the, uh, the as the settlements are uniform the stresses will be higher at this point and at this point and the stress at the center will be lower. So 
So this uh, uh, type of situation is very close to uh, rigid pipe uh, you know embedded in a uh, at certain depth in a soil is uh, very similar to this passive arching phenomenon. So typical rigid pipes include reinforced concrete ones are made of pre-stressed concrete or vitrified clay or polymer concrete a cast iron as well as cement and cast in situ pipes these are all uh, you know the rigid pipes. But the uh, effect of the soil settlement on rigid pipes is actually shown here the surrounding soil actually settles uh, undergoes settlement here and uh, because of the inherent rigidity this portion is actually not and does not undergo any movement. So you can see that both sides it undergoes surrounding soil prism undergoes movements and this particular portion will not actually undergo any settlement because of the rigidity of the pipe. Now consider uh, the flexible pipe. If the pipe is more compressible than external soil columns as a result of vertical deflection allowing the central prism to settle more in relation to the external prisms then the actual load on the pipe is less than the load at the load of the central prism due to the direction in which the shearing stresses are acting. So this pipe this type of pipes are called flexible pipes so you can see that the settlement D at the at this portion settlement D at this portion. Uh, the soil undergoes in this portion undergoes differential settlement and the surrounding soil does not undergo any uh, you know the uh, movements are relatively less compared to uh, you know in the uh, zone which is actually above the uh, pipe. So if the pipe is so this condition is very close to active arching condition what we have seen active arching condition where the surrounding uh, soil is actually uh, more compressible. Uh, you know the, the, the structure is actually more compressible than the surrounding soil. So if the pipe is more compressible than external soils as a result of vertical deflection uh, allowing the uh, in its vertical direction allowing the central prism to settle more in relation to external prisms the actual load on the pipe is uh, less than the load of the central prism due to the direction in which the shearing stresses act. So hence this is a condition condition is called flexible pipes. So a flexible pipe has been defined as the one that will deflect at least 2 percent without structural distress. So generally there is also another definition for the flexible pipes is a flexible pipe has been defined as one that will deflect at least 2 percent without structural distress and uh, uh, the deflection uh, is limited uh, for less than 2 percent with the rigid lining and coating and if you are having rigid lining and flexible coating. Uh, then it is 3 percent the deflection is to be limited less than 3 percent of the diameter uh, with uh, rigid lining and flexible coating and if you are having uh, rigid lining and coating then it is uh, should be affected only the deflection is limited only to less than 2 percent. So the flexible pipe condition is active arching condition and rigid pipe condition is the passive arching condition. In case of flexible pipe uh, the act active arching condition the pipe the soil portion above the pipe undergoes differential settlements compared to the adjacent soil prisms and because of this what will happen is that load acting on the pile load acting on the buried pipe will be less depending upon the depend because of the you know the shear resistance offered by the side walls on the both sides of the both sides of the pile that is this portion because of this what will happen the shear resistance will act in this direction and the load is actually a portion that is the load which is actually imposed on the conduit will be less. So if the pipe is more compressible than the external soil columns as a result of vertical deflection allowing the central prism to settle more in relation to the external soil, soil uh, that is soil, soil in the external prisms the actual load on the pipe is less than the load of the central prism due to the direction in which the shearing stresses are acting. So uh, the flexible pipe uh, for examples include steel pipes and uh, ductile iron pipes uh, and uh, thermoplastics such as polyvinyl chloride and uh, HDPE pipes high density polyethylene pipes and thermosetting plastics such as fiberglassing fiberglass reinforced, uh, reinforced uh, polymer FRP pipes and bar wrapped concrete cylinder pipes. So, uh, the for examples for flexible pipes uh, the materials which are actually used for uh, making these flexible pipes include steel, ductile iron, thermoplastics such as PVC and high density polyethylene pipes and uh, thermosetting plastics such as fiberglass and reinforced uh, fiberglass reinforced polymer that is FRP pipes and bar wrapped concrete cylinder pipes. 
Now here uh, the typical uh, favorable arch conditions are actually shown arching effect in underground conduits you can see that here this is a flexible pipe so where the direction of ready to settlement will be here in this direction the resistance from the side walls actually act upwards so because of this load acting in the central portion will be less. So in this case uh, inverted arch action and this is predominant in uh, rigid pipes where uh, the surrounding soil actually settles more compared to the soil above the uh, pipe. So this is inverted arch action which also there in uh, rigid pipes and the favorable arch action that will be there in the, uh, the flexible pipes. Uh, so we have seen that flexible pipe and rigid pipe in the flexible pipe uh, wherein uh, the uh, soil above the uh, pipe will undergo settlement and so because of this uh, the shear resistance uh, participation of active arching and uh, or we can say favorable arching uh, there is a reduction of the load coming onto the pipe. Uh, so the buried conduit uh, will experience the less load. So there is also rigid pipe and then we also said that there is one more category which is called semi rigid pipe. Some pipe materials exhibit characteristics of both rigid and flexible pipes primarily controlled by their diameters and they are basically referred as semi rigid pipes. So semi rigid pipes deflect between 0.1% to 3% without causing harmful or potentially harmful cracks. For example bar wrapped concrete cylinder pipes this is actually an example for the semi rigid pipes. So some pipe materials exhibit the characteristics of both rigid and flexible pipes and primarily controlled by the diameters and basically they are referred these, these, these type of pipes are referred as semi rigid pipes. So in uh, going to uh, understand about uh, Marston load theory for narrow trenches and uh, let us look into the assumptions which are put forward here the cohesion. Uh, if any between the trench fill and the soil in the trench sites is ignored. So the primarily the cohesion if any between the trench fill and the soil uh, in the trench sites is ignored because of its variable and uncertain value depending upon the moisture condition. So uh, the ignorance of this uh, cohesion uh, also uh, would have uh, you know uh, you know uh, lead to the in the conservative side uh, basically the, so that uh, uh, you know uh, we will actually calculate more load on the pipe okay. So as uh, one is that you know one, uh, the considerable time would have to be elapsed before cohesion could develop and second thing is that assumption of no cohesion uh, would yield the maximum load on the pipe that is what we are discussing that assumption of uh, no cohesion will yield the maximum load on the pipe. So the cohesion if any between the trench fill and the soil uh, uh, in the trench sites is ignored because of its variable and uncertain value depending upon the, the moisture condition and the soil density and the frictional properties are assumed to remain constant over depth and the soil friction is assumed to vary in the direction proportion, uh, direct proportional to the active horizontal pressure of the fill against the trench faces. So the soil density and the frictional properties are assumed to remain constant over the depth and the soil friction is assumed to vary in direct proportion to the active horizontal pressure uh, of the fill against the trench faces. So we have uh, when a pipe is embedded in a narrow trench uh, we have the two side faces when you are actually taking uh, per unit length of the pipe. So uh, the cohesion is ignored the ignorance of the cohesion uh, has uh, you know as because one is that the reason for ignoring the cohesion is that a considerable time would have to elapse before the cohesion could develop. And second thing is that it is uh, ignorance of the cohesion leading to a conservative assumption as the no cohesion would yield the pipe will be designed for that type of load which is coming from the overburdened soil above the pipe. And the soil density and the frictional properties are assumed to remain constant over the depth and the soil friction is assumed to vary in direct proportion to the active horizontal pressure of the fill against the trench faces. So in this uh, particular uh, uh, slide. A free body diagram of the ditch conduit is actually shown here. A pipe of diameter external diameter BC and or a conduit of BC and internal diameter let us say small d and the width of the trench is indicated here as BD but from the terminology we can also write B is equal to BD and so let Z is the depth from the natural ground surface so this is the ditch conduit condition. So Marston load theory is based on the concept of the prism of soil in the trench that impose a load on the pipe. 
So h is the height uh, you know above the uh, center of the pipe and uh, b is equal to b d and uh, so these are the uh, you know the side wall uh, prisms and uh, this is the portion of the soil uh, above the, the soil within the prism uh, uh, which is above the pipe and uh, this is called the bedding of the pipe uh, you know and then consider the per unit length uh, per unit length. So the Marston load theory is based on the concept of a prism of, prism of soil in the trench that imposes a load on the pipe. So this is basically for ditch conduit uh, the weight of the war burden soil transferred to the underlying soil with the due consideration to the soil arching action. So equating upward and downward forces uh, we get uh, CD into gamma into BD square. So uh, the how we have got is nothing but we have taken a, a thin horizontal slice of having thickness small dh at a depth h below the ground surface or at a depth z below the ground surface and when this uh, uh, the self weight of this uh, uh, the soil within the wedge is nothing but uh, gamma that is the unit weight of the soil backfilled into the trench after installing the pipe gamma into bd into dh. So bd into dh into 1 is the volume that is the per unit length into gamma is the weight of the slide weight force acting like this. Now at a given portion at a given portion say at a given depth here what you can see is that V is the uh, vertical uh, load acting over an area uh, that is nothing but BD into BD into 1. So V by BD is the vertical stress into K that is nothing but the K is nothing but the coefficient of earth pressure which is uh, uh, you know ratio of lateral pressure that is horizontal pressure to vertical pressure. So K into vertical stress uh, into dh acting over a small length that is the dh into 1 that is the uh, force acting uh, you know uh, acting on the normal force acting on the side wall face. So we can get the frictional force when this mass moves downwards K into mu dash or mu into V by BD dh is the countering uh, shear resistance or shear force. So this, these are the, the from those two sides we actually have the shear forces and here there, are, here there is a normal force acting at a given depth. So how we have got this one is nothing but this is nothing but V by BD is the vertical stress V by BD into 1 uh, into K is the horizontal stress into DH is uh, DH into 1 is the horizontal uh, force and then into multiplied by mu dash you will get the uh, you know the frictional force acting along the that shear, shear force acting toward this direction this side direction and this direction. Now we taking the equilibrium of sigma f is equal to 0 what we get is that we get a differential equation and then once we solve that one and for this condition then we get this v is equal to cd into gamma into bd square. So uh, this is what actually is been described here for sigma f is v is equal to 0 taking upward vertical forces are equal to the downward vertical forces. So for equilibrium vertical force at the bottom plus shear force at the sides is equal to vertical force at the top plus weight of the element on the slice. So vertical force at the bottom that is the bottom of the slice and shear force at the sides is equal to vertical force at top and weight of the element. So that is vertical force at the bottom that is nothing but V plus delta V and shear forces at sides that is because the two sides are there it is multiplied by. Uh, 2 into k into v uh, by b d d h into mu dash. So two, two sides are there so multiplied by 2 is equal to v that is the stress acting on the top of the slice horizontal slice plus uh, the self weight force that is gamma b d into d h. By simplifying what we get is that uh, 0 is equal to b d minus 2 k mu v mu dash v by b d into d h by d v. So this is basically the solution of differential equation uh, and uh, the solution will actually yield to V is equal to gamma BD square by 2K mu dash into 1 minus uh, E to the raise minus 2K uh, mu dash uh, by H uh, by BD H by BD. So uh, this uh, 
expression for W where V is equal to gamma C D B D square. So this is given as you know the C D is nothing but 1 by 2 k mu into 1 minus e to the raise minus 2 k mu z by b where k is nothing but the quotient of at pressure and mu is the quotient of friction for a granular soil backfill ditch interface that is the quotient of friction of the granular soil backfill and ditch wall interface and which way which can vary from 0 for a smooth wall and tan phi dash for a rough wall where phi dash is the angle of shearing resistance of the granular soil fill and gamma is nothing but the unit weight of the granular backfill and B is equal to BD is the trench width and CD is the load coefficient. So this is the load coefficient. So this if you use V is equal to CD uh, gamma CD uh, BD square if you are able to get then we can actually get the load on the pipe. So the CD can be obtained by 1 by 2 k mu in, uh, into 1 minus E to the raise minus 2 k mu into Z by B. When Z is equal to H then you know it will be on the top of the pipe that is the uh, you know uh, if you consider uh, this portion when Z is equal to capital H we will get the load coming or the stress coming on uh, into the this particular portion in kilo Newton per meter. Now let us look uh, variation of uh, C D with Z by B for uh, different values of uh, K mu. So what we said is that uh, this particular uh, graph which is actually shown uh, where the CD is plotted on the x axis from 0 to 5 that is the load coefficient and Z by B uh, which is uh, uh, Z is equal to 0 at the top of the uh, that is at the ground surface and uh, for no arching no soil arching the smooth wall you can see that uh, you know the uh, you know this particular uh, uh, curve tends to be somewhere here. But when there is you know k mu is equal to 0.1, k mu is equal to 0.15, and k mu is equal to 0.2, as the as the you know you can see that k mu is increasing, there is a decrease in the CD value. With an increase in k mu value, there is a decrease in the k mu value, there is a decrease in the CD. So in the in case of you know the, this variation of CD with Z by B for different values of k mu. Handy and Spangler 2007 they suggested that K mu can be taken conservatively as 0.11 for saturated clays where it is a multiplication of K. Initially Marston proposed K0, KA that is the Rankine's active earth pressure condition for K. This was originally proposed by Marston. Now it is actually you know convenient to consider K is equal to K0 where K0 is equal to uh, you know coefficient of earth pressure at rest uh, that is for uh, like by using uh, uh, Jackie's formula it is 1 minus sin phi and where phi is the friction angle and uh, it is also uh, 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 convenient uh, to consider tan mu is equal to delta where delta is the interface friction angle between uh, backfill soil and as well as the side wall uh, soil in the side wall. So Handy and Spangler suggested uh, that K mu can be taken as conservatively as 0.11 uh, for saturated clays and 0.19 for the uh, you know the granular soils with all other soils they lie within this range. That means that for uh, most of the soils uh, they fall within this range that is the K mu factor will actually fall in between 0.1 to 0.2. When the K mu is increasing there is a significant reduction in C D hence the load on the trans hence the load transfer to the conduit. So when C D you know decreases that is when K mu increases then there is a decrease in the C D value the significant reduction in the C D value can be seen and that is the, that implies that the load on the conduit also reduces. So here what we have seen is that W that is V is equal to gamma C D you know B D square. Uh, with that what actually we said is that uh, when a smooth wall is there no arching is taking place uh, then this is the situation. So when we have uh, you know large uh, width of the trench and uh, when there is a no participation of arching then you know we may actually end up uh, you know uh, condition where no soil arching takes place. But for most of the soils where Q mu, uh, K mu falls within between 0.1 to 0.2 where when K mu increases there is a significant reduction in the CD value hence the load imposed on the 
or applied onto the or transferred to the conduit also will be less. So in this particular slide uh, the approximate values of uh, ratio of lateral to vertical earth pressure uh, K and uh, coefficient of friction against the sides of the trench is given and uh, here uh, it is uh, this is the Rankine uh, ratio uh, where K uh, which is uh, given as 0.33 for a partially compacted uh, damp top soil and the coefficient of friction is uh, mu. Uh, uh, then you know saturated top soil it is 0.37 and uh, the coefficient of friction is 0.4 the partially compacted damp clay is 0.33 k value and the coefficient of friction is 0.4 the saturated clay is 0.37 and uh, coefficient of friction is uh, 0.3 and dry sand it is 0.33 Rankine ratio k and uh, coefficient of friction is 0.5 and wet sand it is 0.33 and uh, coefficient of friction is 0.5. So when we have seen that in the previous equation when uh, uh, V is equal to gamma uh, uh, CD into uh, CD into gamma CD into BD square where uh, by substituting for in the CD expression when, uh, when substituting H is equal to H or Z is equal to H we get the total vertical pressure at the elevation of the top of the conduit. Now how much of this vertical V load V is imposed on the conduit is depend upon the relative compressibility of the pipe and soil. So uh, that we have discussed about the different uh, types of the uh, pipes uh, where flexible pipe or rigid pipe for very rigid pipe the clay or concrete or heavy walled cast iron and so forth the side fills may be very compressible in relation to the pipe for very rigid pipe that is like clay or concrete or heavy walled cast iron and so forth the side fills may be very compressible in relation to the pipe and the pipe may carry practically all the load V for that means that for most of the rigid pipes the entire load is transferred to the pipes. In case of flexible pipes the imposed load will be substantially less than V since the pipe will, uh, will be less uh, rigid than the side fill soil. So in case of flexible pipes the imposed load will be substantially less than V since the pipe will be less rigid than the side of the soil. So the how much vertical load is transferred onto the conduit is depending upon the relative compressibility or relative stiffness of the pipe and soil that is the pipe soil relative stiffness. So we have understood now for very rigid pipes and the side fills may be very compressible in relation to the pipe and the pipe may carry practically all the load and uh, the type of arching also comes into picture here is that passive arching and uh, in case of flexible pipes the imposed load will be substantially less than V since the pipe will be less rigid than the side fill soils so that is active arching phenomenon. So if you look into this uh, the schematic representation of soil pipe contribution in load carrying opportunity uh, rigid pipe uh, carries almost uh, uh, you know 80 percent of the load and uh, only soil carries uh, you know 20 percent. In case of flexible pipe the soil bears the entire uh, load and uh, only 20 percent of the load is actually apportioned by the pipe. So the because of the active arching condition what will actually happen is that the flexible pipe uh, attracts less load and uh, it actually transfers the load to the, the surrounding uh, non yielding portions and uh, the favorable arching phenomenon uh, is actually used in case of a flexible pipes. So this particular uh, slide shows the strength contribution percentage in uh, uh, y axis and rigid pipe or flexible pipe as a type of this thing. So this uh, clearly it shows that this uh, pipe and uh, soil uh, contribution rigid pipe is actually very high uh, the load uh, portioning uh, capability is very high compared to flexible pipe. So effect of the ditch width on the loading on the pipe so here uh, the width of the trench and width of the uh, suppose if you are having uh, uh, you know uh, less width of the uh, trench then the, the pipe actually attracts uh, less load because of the participation of the trench and uh, if uh, uh, width of the trench is actually more then the load carrying the pipe increases with the width of the trench so that width of the trench should be just enough for the compaction of the soil uh, on the sides of the pipe. So here uh, you know what we have tried to understand is that the effect, effect of the ditch width on the loading on the pipe if you look into it if we are actually having 
uh, you know the large uh, you know large width of the trench there is a possibility that uh, you know the pipe attracts the more load. So when I have, we have to be careful in actually selecting the width of the trench such that uh, it is actually just possible to do the compaction and uh, so the, there should be an optimum width of the trench such that the pipe will not actually attract the more load. This, so this analogy is actually very similar uh, to the uh, you know the slope stabilization technique by using uh, piles. When we are actually having piles which are actually spaced closer we said that you know the participation of arching is very very significant. When the piles are actually uh, sparsed or you know spreaded along the slope and which are actually farther uh, if they are actually spaced at larger uh, spacings then we said that uh, the participation of uh, you know the arching will be uh, very very less. So the effect of the ditch width on the loading on the pipe if you look into it the load carried by the pipe increases uh, with the width of the trench. So the width of the trench should be just enough for the compaction of the soil on the sides of the pipe. And similarly the mode of failure of the flexible pipes if you look into it uh, when, uh, when well compacted soil provides good lateral support to the pipes but poorly compacted soil provides reduced lateral support to the pipes. So the pipe actually undergoes uh, you know the changes in its uh, shapes uh, particularly for flexible pipes one can see that the pipe undergoes uh, deformations like this the uh, you know the elliptical uh, shapes which will actually take because of the loss of the support on the sides. So the poorly compacted soil pro, uh, pro, uh, you know provides reduced lateral support to the pipes. If you are having uh, you know well compacted soil and the provides the good lateral support and uh, the settlements will be within the allowed uh, you know uh, the 2% uh, uh, of the diameter of the pipe. So if you are having a mode of failure of a flexible pipe if you look into it the poorly compacted soil produces less lateral support to the pipes and because of the loss of the support the pipe actually undergoes changes and uh, you know further increase of any external loading which we will be actually discussing in the next lecture with that what will happen is that the pipe can actually can undergo uh, distress. Similarly when you are actually having uh, rigid pipes uh, we said that rigid pipes attract the most of the load and the structural strength and wall uh, well compacted soil provide good lateral support to the pipe and poor structural strength for example that uh, if the pipe is actually subjected to certain uh, you know the cracking uh, this uh, poor structural strength provides a reduced lateral support to the pipes and uh, the uh, you know the cracking uh, can actually can uh, endanger the uh, pipe uh, integrity. So what we have seen in this particular lecture is that we introduced ourselves to the different uh, conditions uh, one is called uh, the projecting conditions one is uh, trench condition or ditch condition then we said that uh, different types of uh, uh, positive projecting uh, projective conduits and negative projecting conduits and I also discussed about the imperfect uh, 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 projection condition. Then we also discussed about uh, that we tried to distinguish between rigid pipes and uh, uh, you know uh, uh, flexible pipes and uh, in, in a way we actually brought active arching and passive arching phenomenon and we said that active arching phenomenon is actually predominant in uh, flexible pipes and passive arching phenomenon is actually uh, prevalent and pre or predominant in uh, rigid pipes and then uh, we also discussed about the Marston's uh, uh, load theory for uh, uh, trench condition that is the ditch condition wherein we said that uh, in case of a flexible pipe and uh, depending upon the as the stress is actually apportioned by the uh, side wall friction the load transfer to the pipe will be reduced. And we also said that how the load can be computed by using V is equal to CD into gamma into BD square and we said that if the breadth of the trench is actually large and then pipe can actually uh, you know attract the uh, more amount of the load. And then we also have seen finally the different uh, typical uh, mode of modes of failures of uh, flexible pipes where flexible pipe failure basically undergoes uh, large deformations and uh, the, def the deflections or deformations such that the shape of the flexible pipe will actually change. Then in case of rigid pipe there it can undergo uh, you know the stress cracking and uh, the poor this is because of the poor inferior uh, strength of the pipe and which actually can reduce the uh, cross section 
because of that what will happen is that uh, the lateral support to the pipes will be lost. 